Hi, everybody, and welcome to our penultimate live stream um, for the Northumberland Dark Sky Festival. And our very special guest tonight is um, the Astronomer Royal, Lord Martin Rees, who's going to talk about our future in space, life in space, and so on. And um, as you know, uh, every night this week, I've been doing a little introductory talk about the festival. And I'm going to only touch upon that tonight because I suspect most of you have seen it enough times now. Um, and I'm not going to put up my PowerPoint, but I am going to say, um, oh, hold on a second. Oh, it's not working. That says it's working. No, it is working. Good. Yes, it is working. <laughs> For a second, I thought we were we were not working, um, but it is. So that's great. Um, so I'll do a very brief introduction to the festival. Um, my name is Roy Alexander. I am a director of a, a, a social enterprise called Astro Adventures and the Battlesteads Observatory in Northumberland. And the festival was put together very last minute a couple of months ago and uh, people uh, have been able to um, join us online, which is one of the uh, fantastic benefits of this wonderful technology. Um, it's a bit of a shame really that we're having to do that because of the pandemic. And what we hope is that we will see you next year in the 2022 festival, perhaps in, in real time, in real space up here under the wonderful starry skies of Northumberland. Um, what we'd very much like to do is encourage you when you do visit us to visit all of the four observatories. You've got Kielder Observatory, Battlesteads Observatory, Twice Brood Observatory, and now Stonehop Astronomy Observatory coming online. All wonderful places run by fantastic people. Um, <clears throat> Now, without any further ado, I'm going to mute my microphone and turn off my camera, and I'm going to hand you over to tonight's guest, um, Lord Rees. Over to you, Martin. Yes. Uh, well, uh, thank you, Roy, for inviting me. First of all, can you hear me? Absolutely perfectly. We can Very hear good. you. Very good. Okay. We can uh, see well, you. I... Your PowerPoint is, is looking magnificent. Right. Well, and hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, talking to you all. I only wish I could be up in Northumberland myself, but uh, I'm going to talk about um, uh, our future in space and what we've learned. But let me start off with uh, the answer I give if I'm asked, why do we do astronomy? And there are really several reasons. The first is simply exploration. We want to know what's out there and we want to uh, um, just extend what explorers did on the Earth uh, to uh, uh, the planets and far beyond. But then um, professional astronomers and astrophysicists like myself uh, want to try and make sense of what's out there. Just like a geophysicist wants to make sense of, uh, of the Earth. Uh, so uh, we in astronomy, um, if possible, want to try and understand uh, why the stars are shining uh, why they're there, how they form, etc. So we're trying to make sense of this. And the other thing which is important is that out in space there are very extreme conditions so we can learn a lot about the laws of nature which we could never learn on Earth because we need uh, a lab quite impossibly complicated and expensive to simulate the conditions which we find in stars and stellar explosions, etc. So we learn new physics as well as applying the physics we do know to try and make sense of what's out there. And the big picture is really uh, to understand how our universe got the way it is. Uh, we know, and you've all seen pictures of stars and galaxies, etc. Um, and uh, uh, you probably know it started off in some big bang state about 13 or 14 billion years ago. And we'd like to know how it got from that primordial state to what we see around us. And here again, there's been some progress. And we'd like then to be a bit more philosophical and understand a bit more about why things are the way they are. Well, today I'll be talking about things mainly under the first two headings here, just some exploration, what's out there, and trying to understand a bit of uh, the reasons why it's there. Let's start with a bit of history. Um, this is Trinity College, uh, which is uh, where I, I work in Cambridge. Um, it was looked about the same 400 years ago. And uh, this is the best student we ever had. This is, of course, Isaac Newton. And uh, uh, he was a student at Trinity College and uh, later, of course, a professor there. 
And uh, in 1665, this was the plague year, and uh, he went home to Leicester, where, Leicestershire, the farmhouse, uh, where he famously, according to legend, was under an apple tree, and he had his big idea about gravity, about the same force holding the moon in its orbit as the force that makes the apple fall. Now, that may be an entire myth, but uh, it's rather interesting to say that uh, uh, the only other occasion when the college has been closed is now this year when because of the present plague the college is pretty well empty all the students are at home most of them except for the foreign students uh, i'm uh, hoping that maybe some of them will be under apple trees having great ideas but i don't have any uh, huge expectation of that well newton of course uh, gave us our idea of gravity and showed that it explained the orbits of the uh, planets um, and the moon, uh, as well as phenomena on Earth. Um, and he must have thought about space travel, because this is a picture from the English edition of his great book, The Principia. And you can see what it shows. It shows um, cannonballs being fired from a mountaintop. And if they are not fired very fast, then of course they fall down. But if they're fired fast enough, then their trajectory curves downwards no faster than the Earth curves away underneath them. So they go into orbit. And this, I think, is still the neatest way to explain to students the concept of orbital flight. Just imagine firing projectiles from a hilltop faster and faster. And of course, neglecting air resistance, if you get up to a certain speed, then it'll go into orbit. And Newton worked out the speed that was needed to go into orbit, and it's about 18,000 miles an hour. Far beyond, of course, <clears throat> what could be done by the cannon of his time. And of course, it wasn't until 1957 that the first object went into orbit, and this was the uh, Sputnik, Sputnik 1, launched by the Soviet Union in 1957. And this was followed by uh, the Soviet launches of those dogs into space. And then four years after Sputnik 1, Yuri Gagarin, the first man in space, he, he did uh, an orbit and uh, became a great celebrity. Uh, I don't know the age distribution of people who are listening today, but some are probably old enough that they remember uh, these events, as, as I do. And um, when Gagarin came to London, uh, he was uh, mobbed by enthusiastic crowds as a great hero, deservedly so. Uh, but uh, the prime minister then was Harry Macmillan, and he was an old cynic, really, and he said, it would have been twice as bad if they'd sent the dog. But anyway, uh, uh, Gagarin was received with great enthusiasm. And of course, the Americans were uh, having their rival space program. And of course, they overtook the Russians. The Russians had an early lead, but uh, they didn't uh, uh, develop as fast. And only um, about um, six years after Gagarin's flight, we had this picture taken by Apollo 7 by Ed Anders orbiting the moon, showing the Earth and showing the Earth how its uh, delicate biosphere contrasted with the sterile moonscape in the foreground of this picture. And of course, this picture called Earthrise um, has become iconic among environmentalists over the last 50 years. And uh, in 1969, again only 12 years after Sputnik 1, uh, we had Neil Armstrong's first small step on the moon. And I treasure this picture signed for me just a few years ago by seven of the Apollo astronauts. Um, Neil Armstrong didn't sign this, but I did have the privilege of meeting him. And indeed, uh, I even sp spoke, uh, giving a lecture where he was in the audience and uh, he was sitting in the front row seemingly taking notes and interested. 
and uh, he might have been doing the crossword for all I know, but anyway, it was a great privilege to see him, and he was uh, a famously very normal seeming person, and uh, he was the first man on the moon. And uh, the, um, there are three of the astronauts who walked on the moon who are still alive, um, and uh, um, no one has been back to the moon since 1972. Uh, this is Apollo 17, uh, which took this moon buggy, um, and uh, Kernan and Schmidt were on this, and they returned to Earth in 1972, and no one, of course, has been further than low Earth orbit since that time. And it's rather odd, really, because uh, I remember this time, and I was thinking, um, probably, given that we've gone from Sputnik to all this in just um, um, 12 years or so, uh, it'll only be another decade before we have footprints on Mars. But of course that didn't happen. And um, uh, uh, men on the moon is now ancient history. I mean, uh, the um, older people in the audience can remember this, but to, to my students, it's ancient history. They know the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the men on the moon, uh, was uh, old, and they know that just as the Egyptians built pyramids, um, and uh, we don't understand the motives, um, so the Americans sent people to the moon, and it wasn't quite clear why. But of course, the reason they were sent to the moon was as part of a superpower rivalry to beat the Russians to the moon. And the reason that uh, manned spaceflight languished is that having got to the moon, there was no motive to go on spending the huge amount they'd been spending. They'd been spending about 4% of the American federal budget on this moonshot, and they cut back after that. It's now about 0.6% of the national budget goes to NASA. And people have, of course, been into orbit, into space, many hundreds of them, uh, many on the uh, National Space Station. But of course, although space travel by humans had its high point 50 years ago, space has, of course, uh, transformed our lives. I'm going to talk about space exploration, but we know we did spend every day on space for uh, sat nav, for navigation, uh, for weather forecasting, and everything else. Uh, so it's become sort of routine. But it's, of course, been important for astronomers because it has allowed us to send probes uh, to the planets of our solar system uh, to land on them or send close up images of them. So what I'm going to do next is to uh, give you a little tour through the solar system, uh, through these planets. So if you were going out, you'd be launched in a rocket like this. And this would be the most uncomfortable part of the journey probably. And then, when you got about 10 million miles away, you could look back and you might see something like this, the Earth and the Moon. And here the sun is coming from the right-hand side. So you see a sort of half Earth and a half Moon. And you would then get to uh, uh, the red planet, Mars. And of course, Mars has been very much in the news uh, because um, three spacecraft have arrived there in the last couple of weeks. Uh, the first was uh, a small uh, uh, one organized by the um, United Arab Emirates, um, and that, that is in orbit around Mars, going to study the atmosphere. And then, of course, there was the Viking lander, which probably many people watched last night. And there's a Chinese uh, probe which has got into orbit about a week ago, and it's going to land uh, two smaller craft. I think in the next week or two, I'm not quite sure when, but that won't be quite as difficult as uh, doing a direct landing because these two little landers are already in a craft that's orbiting the uh, planet Mars, and so um, the speed that you have to lose is not nearly as great as the uh, speed you have to lose if you're coming directly from the Earth. So 
there have been many uh, attempts to go to Mars and many landers. And um, this is um, a picture of Curiosity, which is a probe that was launched about 10 years ago. And um, uh, the, the one that's uh, called Perseverance that was launched yesterday is a sort of bigger and more sophisticated version of, of this. But this uh, was landed in the middle of a, a crater. Um, well, towards the edge of a crater, the um, landing site is um, up in the little oval in the top left of this picture. And this crater is about 100 miles across. And the Curiosity rover, which is trying to understand the geology and get pictures, is trundling across the uh, surface and will eventually end up at that mountain in the middle. And then when we get beyond Mars, we next get to Jupiter, the giant of the solar system. And many probes have been to Jupiter and to its moons. Um, uh, this is a perhaps less familiar picture of Jupiter. This was taken um, by Juno, an American spacecraft. And this shows the, the weather at the sort of North Pole of Jupiter. So all these swirls are sort of cyclones there. So, so the weather is very turbulent in Jupiter. And of course, these are the four big moons of Jupiter, which have been known since Galileo's time. And uh, uh, they're very different. Io is sulfurous and volcanic. Europa has ice on its surface and probably an ocean underneath it. And again, um, uh, we'd like to have things landing on, on these. Um, we've just got close up pictures so far. Saturn has been probed in particular by the Cassini probe. The Cassini probe uh, was launched in, I think about 1990s. It took seven years to get to Saturn. And then it spent 13 years observing Saturn and its moons. And it ended its life by plunging into Saturn just about a year ago. And it observed in particular um, um, the moons. But I'm just going to show this rather remarkable picture. This is a picture it, it showed uh, when it was lined up with Saturn and the Sun. So this shows an eclipse of the Sun by Saturn. And it's a picture was taken by the Cassini spacecraft. And although it's probably too small to see, uh, the Earth is somewhere, somewhere there. This is uh, one of the moons of Jupiter, the moon of Saturn, sorry, uh, Titan, uh, which uh, uh, in fact was landed on because Cassini carried in its cargo bay uh, a small uh, spacecraft called Huygens, uh, which was uh, built by Europeans and actually landed with a parachute on Titan. And Oddly enough, it's easy to land by parachute on Titan and on Mars because Titan has a fairly thick atmosphere, whereas the problem of Mars is that its atmosphere is only 1% of the density of the uh, Earth's atmosphere. And so a parachute doesn't exert enough drag to really slow down a big heavy craft like Perseverance. So anyway, this is the surface of uh, Titan. It looks rather nice with lakes and uh, the little rivers as well, but, the temperature is minus 160 degrees centigrade, and these lakes are liquid methane, not water. So it's a very inhospitable environment for any kind of life like ours. And this is another moon of Saturn called Enceladus, which looks very different from Titan. This is smaller, but it's rather like Jupiter's moon Europa. It's covered in ice, and we have good evidence that under this ice, there is an ocean. We know that because uh, the um, orbits of uh, Cassini going close to it showed anomalies in the gravity indicating an ocean. And also um, close-up pictures show spray coming out from the uh, surface through gaps in the ice. So almost certainly there's a, some, some, something warm underneath 
uh, this size. Well, that's uh, um, one of the fascinating moons orbiting Saturn. And then, of course, uh, we had these pictures of Pluto, uh, which came back from uh, uh, an American probe called New Horizon. I've got another picture there. No, and um, the point I want to make at this stage is that um, these uh, probes, like uh, New Horizon, which took this, this picture, and the um, Cassini probe, uh, they were all designed in the 1990s. Because they're designed, it takes five years to build, to, to, to build them, and then up to 10 years on their journey, and then they take the observations. And if we think how miniaturization has evolved in the last 20 years, think of our smartphones, compare them with the phones we had 20 years ago, then you realize how much better we can do now if we were designing probes to go to the outer planets. And so what I think will happen is that uh, in the coming decade or two, there will be maybe whole flotillas of miniaturized probes using all the technology that we now have from uh, smartphones, which will go to all these moons uh, of the outer planets and send back pictures. And some bigger ones will go, and indeed there's a hope that there will be a probe that will go to um, Europa um, and actually study the ice and maybe even probe under the ice, or perhaps to Enceladus or Saturn, but uh, those would need quite big probes, but lots and lots of small probes could perhaps be sent simply to take pictures of all these exciting places. Now, what about the role of people? Um, as I said, we've had uh, um, no high point of manned space flight to match the Apollo landings, even though they're 50 years ago. But will there be footprints on Mars? This is, uh, of course, a fascinating question. Um, and some people are very enthusiastic about this. I'm a bit ambivalent about this. The reason is that as robots and miniaturization get better, the practical need to send people into space is getting less than it was in the past. It was essential to send people to uh, refurbish the Hubble Space Telescope and etc. cetera. Um, and it's less necessary now uh, because we have robotic fabricators who could do things like that. And of course, sending people, if you want to bring them back safely, is hugely expensive. The Americans spent two thirds of their total budget on the man's program using the shuttle and the space station. Um, and it's not clear how much exciting work came out of that. And of course, they're very risk averse because the shuttle was launched 135 times and there were two crashes when all the crew were lost. Each of those crashes was a big national trauma which delayed the program for three years and caused extra expense. Well, two failures in 135 launches, that's less than 2%. And my view is that if we better if we left manned space flights, which is now really just an adventure, an exploration, not needed practical, leave it to people prepared to accept a higher risk, like the people who hang glide in Yosemite or um, people like Sir Ranulph Fiennes and people like that, who are prepared to accept a much higher risk. And that can be done in a cut price way. And I don't think any Western government or Western public is going to be happy to accept the death of people who they're supporting. But on the other hand, I think this is a case where the project should be left to the private sector. And again, as you probably know, Elon Musk's SpaceX and Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin. These are seriously funded high-tech space companies which are able to put things into orbit and they have plans for man manned space flights. And I personally think it'd be best if we can leave manned space flights uh, to, to them and cheer them on. 
And they, if they're sensible, they won't call it space tourism. They'll call it space adventure. And of course, they will then um, realize that those who go are people who do dangerous sports and that some may die, but uh, that will um, be really part of the, um, the risk uh, which people are happy to accept if they are doing dangerous sports. So that's what I think will happen. Of course, uh, Elon Musk himself um, doesn't uh, uh, think this. He does want to have large numbers of people going to Mars by the end of the century, maybe a million people going to Mars. Um, I personally think this is a dangerous delusion. Um, he and also my late colleague, Stephen Hawking, they thought that um, the earth is getting um, so dangerous, climate change and all that, that it would be good to have a community uh, to escape the earth's problems. But I think that's a dangerous delusion um, because dealing with climate change on earth is a real doddle compared to making Mars habitable. It would be hugely difficult to do that. And otherwise, um, th those who go to Mars will have to um, live in a little sort of bubble. There's no atmosphere and it will be far less comfortable than living at the South Pole or at the bottom of the ocean or the top of Everest. And we don't find millions of people want to do any of those things. So I personally think that um, space exploration is going to be um, uh, just for a few adventurers and that uh, all the this serious stuff, the exploration will be done by robotic uh, um, uh, explorers, um, which uh, with AI, would be as good as a human geologist and, uh, and the robots will be able to fabricate <clears throat> large structures in space without the need for people to go. <clears throat> so that's just my view, um, but Musk doesn't agree. And um, he says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. And I think he's 49 years old now. Uh, so in 40 years time, he might be able to do that. And there may be a small colony of people uh, who are on Mars. And I think if uh, that does happen, I think we would all cheer on these great adventures, just like we cheered on the great explorers of the past. And I think they will have a big impact on what happened in the far future. So let me digress into a bit of <clears throat> much more like science fiction. Those people on Mars, will find they're ill-adapted to their habitat. The wrong gravity, the wrong atmosphere, etc. And by the end of the century, uh, there'll be technology, there'll be genetic modification, and there'll be cyborg techniques to plug into uh, to a computer. And I think we're going to have to regulate all these on, here on Earth, but out there, they'll be away from the regulators, and we should wish them good luck in adapting their progeny to this very hostile environment, which they found on Mars. And they would become a new species within a few hundred years. And if they become an electronic species, and some people think that that would happen, then of course, they may not need an atmosphere at all. They may prefer zero G. And so they may not want to stay on Mars. They may go off into the blue yonder. And if they're near immortal, then they won't be deterred by a very long voyage to the other stars. So the idea of uh, interstellar travel is not crazy. It's just that it's a post-human, not a human uh, possibility because we, are, uh, we can't adapt ourselves to um, these long voyages. We don't live long enough, but in the very far future, uh, we can well imagine that there will be probes manned by these post-human creatures, uh, which will be able to traverse interstellar distances. And this brings up the question that I'm always asked, and I'm sure all, all, all of you, when you say your astronomers are asked, which is, are we alone? Is there life out there already? Or is the galaxy waiting for our post-human progeny to, uh, uh, to move through it. Again, we just don't know. 
We don't know whether life is a rare fluke that started here on Earth or whether it exists in lots of places. We do know that there's no very exciting advanced life in our solar system. Um, but of course, one of the reasons why we are excited about Mars is to see if there's any evidence of past life, even of a simple kind, that can be found by digging under the surface of Mars. And also uh, in a decade or two, by doing the same um, uh, under the ice of uh, Europa or Enceladus. So I think these are possibilities. Um, at the moment, we don't know. Of course, there are some people who think they know. Uh, one of the uh, um, benefits or otherwise of being an astronomer royal is to get letters from people who say they've uh, um, met the aliens, they've been abducted by the aliens, etc. cetera. And uh, um, when I get these letters, I uh, have two responses. One is to say, you know, do these people really think that if the aliens had made the huge effort to traverse interstellar distances, that they would, when they got here, just meet one or two well-known cranks, maybe make a corn circle and then go away again. It doesn't sound to me very likely. And I also uh, suggest that they write to each other and not write to me. And I don't hear from them again. But uh, of course, although we haven't had evidence of aliens, um, I think we should be open-minded as to whether they exist. And as you probably know, there are um, efforts more sophisticated to um, uh, try and uh, look for artificial radio transmissions or any artifacts that could be uh, evidence for alien life. And in fact, there's a, a Russian um, billionaire resident in the US called Yuri Milner, who runs something called the Breakthrough Foundation. And he's putting $100 million over 10 years into expanding the search for evidence for um, extraterrestrial intelligence, the SETI program using radio telescopes, optical telescopes, etc. And um, I, in fact, chair his advisory committee. So I'm very positive about this quest, although I'm not holding my breath for success in uh, finding intelligent life. But the case for life itself, even simple life, is interesting. And I'll tell you why. Supposing that we found some life on Mars, or elsewhere in a solar system, then if we could be sure that has an independent origin, then that would immediately say that the origin of life wasn't a rare fluke that just happened on Earth, but happened in many places. It would happen on any planet like the Earth. And that's especially exciting because, as I'm going to say in a few moments, we now know that there are many millions of planets like the Earth orbiting other stars. So at the moment, it's, perhaps people don't realize that although we understand Darwinian evolution, how from simple protozoa over nearly 4 billion years, life has evolved into the biosphere of which we're a part, people don't understand how the initial life formed, the transition from complex chemicals to the first metabolizing, reproducing entity we call alive. We don't understand that. And that's why we don't know if it's a fluke, whether it's routine. But the reason that this is a more germane question now is obviously partly because of what we can observe in our solar system, but more important about my next topic, which is uh, life um, uh, around other stars. And I now want to say a bit about uh, what's perhaps the most exciting thing that's happened in astronomy in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, which is realizing that most other stars are orbited by, by planets, just as the sun is orbited by familiar planets. So uh, let me say a few words about this. <clears throat> so other stars, far too far away to be reached, of course, by any probe we can build today, uh, they uh, can be observed and we have now very good evidence for planets around them. And uh, I was, this picture shows my colleague Didier Kellars, who got the Nobel Prize last year for being a co-discoverer of the first of these exoplanets. And uh, 
Uh, he's, I mean, Cambridge, he's found many, many more since then, but this was taken the day he learned he got the Nobel Prize, so he was naturally rather chuffed about that. The way in which most of the planets have been found is, is shown here, it's very simple. Um, if you can't see the planet itself, you can observe this, a star, and if a planet transits across the face of a star, then it blocks out a bit of a star's light. So if you measure the uh, brightness of the star with careful photometry, uh, then it will have a dip, and the depth of that dip will tell you how big the planet is. It'll tell you what fraction of the starlight it blocks out. And for instance, if the uh, uh, Earth moving across the face of the sun was observed by some distant aliens, then uh, the Earth's about 1% the uh, diameter of the sun, so one part in 10,000 of the area. So the dip would be one part in 10,000. And of course, the dip would repeat once every year. So by uh, looking for star at stars and measuring their brightness very accurately and repeatedly, then you can look for these repeated dips, which will tell you the year, the orbital period of these planets, and also roughly how big they are. And uh, this technique has been extremely successful. And the NASA Space Telescope Kepler, which uh, went into orbit more than 10 years ago, uh, this carried a telescope which looked at a patch of sky about seven degrees across for three and a half years and measured the brightness of 100,000 stars in that part of the sky, measured each star every hour with a precision in a photometry of one part in 100,000. And it thereby found several thousand candidate planets. And as I say, it can infer their size and their orbital period. And um, well, this is a rather sort of busy slide and the bottom left um, shows a rather silly cartoon, but uh, if you could see it clearly enough, uh, it, it, it uh, depicts the, um, uh, many of the uh, planets found by uh, Kepler, uh, it's, it's plotted where the size of the planet in the orbital period is scaled. Um, but the main point is that these planets have a huge variety they're mainly found this way. Uh, the big ones uh, are found another way. Uh, they're found by um, uh, looking at the star and not looking at the brightness, but looking at its velocity. And if, if a planet is orbiting around it, then it exerts a gravitational pull and the planet causes a star to go in a little orbit. And that is a way in which uh, bigger planets can be found and indeed that's the way the first planet was found, which was a big planet. So we've got these two techniques for finding planets. And we'd really like to actually see the planets because the frustration now is that we have evidence for these planets, but the evidence comes from looking at their effect on their parent star, looking either for the um, for, for the transit, or else looking for, for um, the little wobble in the star. In neither of those cases do we actually observe the, the, the planet. There are only one or two cases when you can actually see the planet. But it would be wonderful if we could do that. And to explain why it would be so wonderful, let's imagine that there were some aliens, say, 50 light years away with a big telescope and that they were looking at our solar system. Then from that distance, the sun would look like an ordinary star. And the earth would look, in Carl Sagan's nice phrase, as a pale blue dot, very close in the sky to its star, our sun, and billions of times fainter. But if the aliens could observe that pale blue dot with enough sensitivity, they could learn quite a bit about it. 
if they could take the spectrum of his light, they could learn about the atmosphere, and they could learn of lots of vegetation on it, lots of chlorophyll and oxygen. And they could also learn about its topography, because the shade of blue would be slightly different depending on whether the Pacific Ocean or the landmass of Eurasia was facing them. So they would learn that there were continents and ocean, and they would learn the length of the day, and they would learn something about the seasons and the climate. We can't do that yet with any of our telescopes, but within 10 years, that kind of information will become available from some of the nearby uh, planetary systems. And the most valuable instrument in doing this will be this one, I here, um, the European uh, giant telescope being built in Chile at the moment. The Europeans aren't very imaginative in their nomenclature. Uh, they called it the Extremely Large Telescope, the ELT. And it is indeed extremely large. Um, it will have a mirror 39 meters across. Not one sheet of glass, but a mosaic of about 800 sheets of glass. But th this instrument, um, with the right spectroscopes on it, will be able to uh, observe the light from a distant star with enough precision to actually pick out the tiny contribution to that light that comes from the planet. And it can then separate out those contributions because the, the planet's contribution will depend on its place in the orbit. And so uh, it should be possible to get at least crude spectra of planets like the Earth orbiting nearby stars. You might get some to the James Webb Space Telescope, but I think most people think that the high resolution spectrograph on the ELT will be more successful in doing this. And this will be a very exciting possibility. And uh, in 10 years, we will therefore uh, know this. And of course, um, if there was vegetation covering one of these planets, uh, then we would um, be able from the spectra to detect it. There's something called the red edge, which is uh, observed um, if there's lots of chlorophyll. And so this is something we can look forward to. Of course, this still won't be giving us images of the planets. Um, these planets will still look like a dot. If we want to actually image one of these planets, uh, then we would need a far, far bigger telescope, an interferometer spanning hundreds of miles. And we'd need something like that built on the moon or probably in space, assembled by robotic fabricators. And I think one of the challenges I mentioned in my book is that this is something we should try and achieve by the year 1068, uh, 2068, to actually have an image of an Earth-like planet around another star. Why do I say 2068? That is 100 years after the famous images of the Earth taken from the Apollo 7 and Apollo 8. So it would be nice if uh, we can put on our walls a poster showing another Earth, which may have some life on it, if not intelligent life. And the exciting thing is that we know that most stars have planets around them. This is what we learned from, from the sample that Kepler studied. And we know that planets like the Earth, the size of the Earth, and in what's called a habitable zone, where stars, uh, where, where water can exist, neither boiling away nor staying frozen, these are quite common. So there are in our Milky Way probably a billion planets where, in principle, life could exist. But where it started there, we don't know. And of course, we shouldn't restrict attention to those because it could be that um, life can exist without water, maybe in an atmosphere like Titan, we just don't know. But this just makes the whole night sky far more interesting when we know that each of the stars in the sky is not just a point of light, but uh, uh, could be uh, something that has a biosphere. And 
I think I've gone on for long enough, but let me just um, uh, make one or two uh, general remarks. Um, I show this picture. Um, this is a flea. And I show it because it was drawn by Newton's least favorite colleague, Robert Hooke. Hooke was one of the people who had an early microscope and he used the microscope to, uh, um, to study um, all kinds of, uh, of small things. And he was a wonderful draftsman. So he produced the Royal Society's first best-selling book um, in the um, uh, 1660s, uh, micro Micrographia. And this is a picture of the flea. I show it um, uh, to put in a bit of modesty on behalf of astronomers, which is to say that you know, it, when you ask as an astronomer, um, isn't it complicated and difficult to try and understand the stars and the galaxies and the planets? I say, well, it's not that difficult because a star is far simpler than an insect. Even this flea has layer upon layer of complex structure, whereas a star has some complications, but it's not nearly as, as complex as, um, uh, as, as the smallest living thing. And so, uh, biology is the biggest challenge in a way, and so uh, it'll be a challenge if astronomers have to understand um, a bit more biology now in order to uh, make the most of their observations. Uh, well, I, I think I've uh, gone on for, for, for long enough, but let me, let me just uh, say uh, one thing about uh, why we shouldn't be surprised that there are planets around most stars. Um, we know that stars are forming in places like, uh, like the um, Eagle Nebula here, and we know they die. This is what the sun will look like when it dies, uh, when it will uh, lose its outer layers and leave behind a white dwarf. Um, and uh, uh, we know that stars, which are heavier than the sun, explode in a violent way as supernova explosions. And this, as most of you probably know, is this Crab Nebula, which is um, the remnants of a supernova explosion witnessed and recorded by Chinese astronomers in the year 1054 AD, nearly a thousand years ago. If anyone can read Chinese, you will see this is the uh, report of the uh, um, uh, Emperor of China's um, court astronomer, I guess he's equivalent of the Astronomer Royal, saying a guest star has appeared and become brighter than the moon and then faded away. Well, the Crab Nebula is still there. And the reason I uh, show it is that um, it may be far away and long ago, but uh, if it wasn't for things like this, we wouldn't be here and there'd be no biology. And the reason for that is that when a star of the kind that became the Crab Nebula is nearing the end of its life, it will have this sort of onion skin structure. It will have uh, uh, burned hydrogen to helium, which is the way stars get most of their energy, but then it will turn helium into carbon and then produce oxygen, neon and magnesium, etc., and produce most of the periodic table by successive nuclear fusions. And then when it faces a crisis, when it can't get any more nuclear energy, then the inner part implodes and it blows off and sprays back out into space all the uh, um, material which was part of its outer layers in its process this way. And that material then condenses into new stars. And so we know that our universe started off with just hydrogen and helium and all the atoms we are made of were created in stars. Stars which lived and died before our solar system formed. And our solar system then condensed from gas contaminated by the debris, of these other stars. And this process can explain why carbon oxygen are common, why gold and uranium are rare, and how they came to be here, and these proportions. And I uh, wanted to show uh, uh, these people. Um, this is a picture taken in 1950, no, sorry, 1971, the 60th birthday of Willie Fowler, 
the bald-headed man there. And I show that because these four people, Margaret Burbage, Jeffrey Burbage, Willie Fowler, and Fred Hoyle, they were the people who formulated the ideas I've just explained. The idea that we are um, literally stardust, or if you're less romantic, we're the nuclear waste from the fuel that made stars shine. And they wrote a classic paper in 1957, um, and this paper was taken in 1971, when Willy Fowler had his 70th birthday, no, 60th birthday. Um, and um, uh, all these people, are sadly, are no longer with us, but Margaret Burbage on the left, she lived to be 100. And this is a picture of her receiving a birthday card from us on her 100th birthday. And um, that was just over a year ago. Um, and she's, she died a few years afterwards, but she, she had a wonderful career and um, she's one of the people who showed that, that what we are made of and what allows biology is that we are stardust. We are remnants of long dead stars. Well, I think I'll finish there, um, but <clears throat> let me remind you that what we're talking about is the um, uh, is what's going on in our galaxy. Our galaxy is like an ecosystem where stars are forming and um, well, well, this picture illustrates what's going on in our galaxy um, and uh, uh, how pristine hydrogen helium gets processed through stars and uh, form new stars and planets, etc. And um, uh, this is the process which is going on in, in, uh, in, our, in our galaxy. And of course, uh, this is what our galaxy would look like if we could get outside it and look back at it. Uh, this, of course, as I'm sure you all know, is Andromeda, a disk galaxy viewed obliquely, which is rather like our galaxy. And this is um, about two and a half million light years away. Um, and it is about as big as our galaxy, a bit bigger, in fact. Um, and it contains uh, um, a black hole lurking at its center. Um, but it's typical of the galaxies that uh, uh, fill our entire universe. And here's another one. And this is uh, a map which shows um, the galaxies in a certain range of, uh, of latitudes um, out to a distance of 400 million light years. And, and each dot here is a galaxy. Yeah. So we're seeing quite a big chunk of the universe. And uh, I just wanted to finish with a, um, a little movie um, because you might ask, how can we actually understand very much in astronomy? How can we actually test our theories? Well, we understand and have done for more than 50 years what goes on in stars and nuclear reactions. We knew nuclear physics. But what about galaxies? How can we understand galaxies? Because they're very far away. They change very slowly. And uh, we can't... Um, really do what a physicist would do, trying to understand atoms. I mean, if you try to understand atoms or the particles they're made of, uh, then you crash them together and, uh, and, and see, see what happens in a big accelerator like the uh, uh, Large Hadron Collider at CERN. And th that's how you learn. Well, we can't crash galaxies together, obviously. We can't do experiments in space, but we can do this in the virtual world of our computer. And I wanted to show you what, what, what the sort of thing we find. This shows two galaxies falling together under their own gravity. Um, and it, it uh, models the uh, stars and the gas and the sort of train wreck. Uh, and eventually this galaxy, these two galaxies will settle down as a single amorphous elliptical galaxy. And uh, when we look into space, we see this. This is two galaxies. Um, uh, and uh, if you look at these two galaxies, you can see they've got dangerously close. And one is pulling out a tidal plume on the other. And if we could come back in 100 million years, we'd find that they had merged. But it's only by um, uh, doing these virtual experiments that we can actually understand galaxies. We can do um, these simulations, making different assumptions about the amount of stars, 
gas and dark matter and see which fits the data uh, well. And um, I want to end with a warning, which is that uh, a collision like this um, will happen in about 4 billion years between our galaxy and Andromeda, because Andromeda uh, is in a little group of galaxies all bound together, falling together, and it'll take about 4 billion years for this crash to happen. Um, and uh, uh, this will be the end of the disk of our galaxy, not the end of the sun, because galaxy uh, stars will still be widely spaced, but this is the future of our galaxy. And um, I think I've gone on for long enough. So let me uh, uh, thank you for listening. And I'd be very happy to answer questions about uh, things I said that were not clear and things I didn't say. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you very much, uh, Martin. Um, I just, we've had so much positivity in the chat, so many questions and so many uh, people saying thank you for us to organise this, but thank you for giving us your time. Um, I don't suppose you want to unshare your screen there. Um, uh, okay. And yeah. then we, then it'll be you and me and I can fire the questions at you. Right, okay. Um, there's about half a dozen or so, but I mean, they're still coming in really, so. Yes, okay. Well, okay. It, it, it's kind of up to you how many you want to ask, answer well, in terms of to go how on, precious right? your time is on a Saturday night. Well, no, yeah. <laughs> um, so I've, I've scribbled a few down in the order, um, but there was one that, that's just come up in relation to that, that galactic collision, mm -hmm. the one that you, you, know, you were talking about between the Andromeda Galaxy and the Milky Way, which is happening in about four billion years, yep. uh, probably on a Monday morning, let's be fair, yeah. that's probably going to happen on a Monday morning. Um, from Tracy Hughes. So if both galaxies have a um, supermassive black hole at the centre, how does that work? Do they merge? Oh, very interesting question. Um, the, the answer is yes. Um, the answer is that, um, uh, of course, our galactic centre does have a black hole of about 4 million uh, solar masses. Andromeda has one which is about 10 times as big. And when this merger happens, uh, then um, these two black holes, they will gradually settle into the center because they, they feel a drag and they're heavier so they go to the center and then they'll find each other and then they will eventually merge by um, uh, emitting gravitational radiation, carry the energy away and they'll make one black hole. Um, I mean, you've probably um, read about gravitational waves from colliding mm. from black hole binaries being detected. The, the, those are black holes that are um, Lems of stars, so they're about 10 or 10 or up to 50 solar masses. This would be a mega version of that. God, oh, definitely. Um, uh, um, but but um, uh, it's happening and it has happened in many other galaxies. And um, we know that there are black holes of several billion mm. suns yeah. um, in um, galaxies, um, and they probably got so big partly by sucking in gas, but partly also by merging the smaller ones. So yeah. um, the, the answer to the question is that um, when two galaxies merge, if they have black holes in them, then the black holes will settle into the center and then a form of self-contained binary system and then eventually gravitational waves will uh, be emitted when it turns into one black hole. That, that's a that's a fantastic answer, which also you threw some extra information there that answered Richard Dorset's question about how black holes form at the center of galaxies. Mm. I, I had one actually, because when I when I and it mm. is related to this, so um I, I noticed that when we started getting the gravitational uh, wave readings from places like LIGO, the mm. thing that, and this always astonishes me, is mm. the speed at which in those last final moments these massive black holes orbit each other. It's like considerable fractions of the speed of light, isn't it? Yes. Yes. What What about the supermassive black holes? Will that Will they be similarly speed? The same. Y yes. So, uh, good uh, lord. The black holes is that um, uh, um, they're all the same except for their size and their spin. They're, they're yeah. standardized objects, almost like elementary particles. But they. Uh, so the main difference is that um, when these supermassive black holes merge, uh, then um, the time scales are slower, just inversely as their mass. So uh, in, in the case of, of our galaxy and Andromeda, those black holes uh, would uh, um, uh, produce radiation at about um, 
uh, one cycle per hour um, rather than uh, um, 100 cycles per second. Um, but I mean, still, you're talking about objects that are millions and t millions of times bigger than the mass of the sun. And that, I mean, that right. would just be something. I'd like to get a ticket to that <laughs> and buy popcorn well, you, well, and you watch would. that show. You wouldn't, you know, you know, you know what happened to you. <laughs> from, a, from a reasonable distance. Oh, yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> well, you, know, um, you, you get too close, you, um, you, will, you will fall in. And you'll be spaghettified. Spaghettified, yeah. of course. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And who knows, you know, what, what we've yeah. got on the other side. So um, another question then. This is less technical and more about yourself and your own interests. From yes. April Harper. Do you read sci-fi? And who is your all-time favourite author? Um, well, I mean, I, I don't read very much sci-fi, but I, I do read some of the the classics, I'm going back to H.G. Wells and people, um, but um, uh, one person I'd like to plug because um, he's a classic and maybe everyone hasn't heard of him is Olav Stapleton. Oh. Uh, you, you, I guess, Roy, you probably know of him, do you? You know what? I actually don't. I, I've got, oh. I mean, I've got almost, oh, I've got almost every single Robert Heinen book next door. Oh, yeah, yes. Yeah, so and I'm, yeah. yeah, and I'm building up, I've got a crack in Arthur C. Clarke selection, um, collection, yes, yes. and I'm now getting into Isaac Asimov. Uh, mm -hmm. But Olaf Stapleton, I am writing he, that down as we speak. Martha. Well, he, um, and just, um, he wrote the two books in particular. Um, one is called Last and First Men, and it's a, uh, it, it, it's a, uh, it's about the next three billion years right. of the solar system of, of species, new species that emerge and things. But, so, so not an ambitious time scale at all. Yes. Really. Um, but, 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 the, but the other one is called Star Maker. Okay. And um, uh, the Star Maker is a creator of universes, mm -hmm. and uh, and he he, um, uh, he, he, he talks about the, um, the, the the creator making different universes and. Um, this is the idea of the multiverse, really, that he already had, and uh, uh, the, the different universes, different numbers of dimensions and all that. And there's even the musical universe, which has right. time and just one spatial dimension. So that's, that, that's what that, I like music. Mm -hmm. and that reminds a, me very much of um, oh, Heinen's book, um, The Number of the Beast. I don't know if you've read that one, but they discover time travel but it's not really time travel they're just jumping between parallel universes ah uh, yes yes so 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 olaf stapleton um i'm sure we're all going to rush yes, off yes. to amazon and buy one and um yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I, I'll see clark of course was a yeah it uh, was closer I, to realism yeah definitely i, I mean I'm, i've i'd love to see diamond based or or carbon uh nano cheap space elevators can you imagine that would be amazing right, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. um I've got a quick question for yeah. you, and um, which is related to that. So I'm just going to say three things, and you just try and pick one, or all three, or none. Star Trek, Star Wars, or Doctor Who? Yes. Uh, I think Doctor, Doctor Who. Hmm. I, I'm just. I've just started watching all the original. I didn't realise you can you can watch them all on well, the box. So right, I'm watching right all to, of them from the right back to Hartnell, who was the first one. Yeah. Yes, that's who I'm watching right uh, now. Yeah. It's wonderful. Uh, kid, have yeah, yes. It's wonderful. Okay, great. Um, fact, uh, uh, and some, of the, uh, and then you spread into into fantasy rather than uh, yeah. The, the, uh, this is a hard side. And in fact, I had some experience. Uh, um, uh, I won something called the Arthur C. Clarke Prize, given by a foundation, as a memory, and, and then the, they give a they give a prize um, every year to a scientist and a science fiction writer. And uh, so I was paired with Mr. George R. R. Martin of Game of Thrones. Oh my goodness! Yes, yeah, so who's a big star, of course, and really, really nice guy, actually, really good. So cool. He, he's fantasy, really, rather than science fiction, isn't he? But yeah, he's a great yeah. talent. So, uh, do you know? So um, we got these. This was just over a year ago. Mm. That's excellent. Um, so, I. Uh, with all of that in mind, um, I mean, obviously we're all we are all fans of yours. So from our perspective, you're a bit of a legend. Thank you again for coming on. Who are you a huge fan of? Who do you who have you in the past been excited to see? Like one or two people who, when you met them, it was like, oh my god, I can't believe I'm meeting you. Yes. Um, well, I mean, this is within within astronomy. Just anybody who 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 are you the biggest fan of who you've met and yes you know and... well uh, let, let me mention two things I mean um, uh, Freeman Dyson 
who oh, was yes. um, a very physician, and, and um, he died age 96, just a, a few months ago. Yeah. And um, I, I fortunately, I met him when I was a postdoc and kept up with him. And he, he, he was interesting because uh, although he'd done very mathematical science when he was young, um, in his later years, he was very speculative and, uh, and full, of, full of all kinds of ideas. Um, so uh, he, he's someone who I particularly admired. And um, perhaps I mentioned someone else, which is um, quite different, which is Joseph Rotblatt, who was, um, uh, uh, and this is, no, this is not for his, his research, but, but as, as a model for the uh, concerned scientist, because uh, he was um, uh, a, f a physicist who worked at Los Alamos, and he was the only person who left the project early um, because he was unhappy unhappy about continuing when it was clear that germs had been defeated. Yeah, um, and yeah. uh, he then became a medical um, uh, uh, researcher, um, medical professor, um, studying the use of radiation for, um, for medical purposes. Um, but he started um, a series of international conferences um, with Bertrand Russell and people like that, um, because he thought that um, the people who'd helped to make the H-bomb the atomic bomb should uh, try to harness the powers that helped unleash. And he and another um, great man, Hans Bethe, who I met, they were leaders of this sort of campaign. Hans so Bethe. They were admirers personality. Wow. Yeah. I mean, that just must be amazing. Los Alamos, the, everything, the history all around that. I, one of my favourite things um, in terms of trying to understand the pressure and, and, and the, that they were all under was Richard Feynman later on talks about coming back to his normal life, mm. walking around, having built the nuclear bomb with that mm. team of people, walking around, looking at people, building skyscrapers and he just wanted to like tear his hair up and run up to them and say what are you doing this is pointless you know it's all going to be gone in a week or in a day or in a minute yeah, um, yeah. We've, we've got tons of questions pouring in so um and again at, at some point i think in the next 10 20 minutes or whenever or whenever you definitely need to say martin <laughs> one more question and then we'll call it a night roy okay, no, um no, I'm fine. <laughs> but i'm going to go back to i've got a I've got some questions from the beginning and what um, obviously in, in terms of talking about space exploration, there's a lot of sci-fi and also a lot of academic research. And now a couple of commercial companies looking at mining on the moon or mining on asteroids. What do you think about that? Yes. Um, well, I mean, uh, I personally think that there's a case perhaps if we're building large artifacts in space or on the moon of trying to get the raw materials from there. Uh, it's not so obvious that it would make sense to bring material back um, to Earth. I know people have said that uh, um, if there's an asteroid made of platinum, you can uh, corner the market by bringing it back to Earth, but the, then the price will collapse, etc. Exactly. So, so you'd uh, have to become the De Beers of interplanetary platinum. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, so, so uh, 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 although um, there is a case for having a, um, a uh, observatory on the moon. Um, mm. uh, it could be assembled mainly by robots. Um, I'm, I'm not so keen on the mining. And the one thing I'm definitely unkeen on is uh, the idea of um, uh, mining to get helium-3. Oh, no, that's really good, because one of yes. the questions was specifically, um, can we go to the moon and get helium-3? So yeah. I, if you want to talk about that for a couple of minutes, I think well, people uh, okay. would be really interested. Yeah. Well, again, I'm, I'm not an expert. Um, First of all, it's, it's um, something to be used in fusion reactors, but it needs twice as high a temperature to get fused from helium-3 than by, by uh, deuterium, et cetera. Um, so it's not clear. Um, but uh, the, the main point is that um, it exists on the moon's surface, but very dilute. So you'd have to really strip mine huge areas of the moon's surface oh, no. and have a big processing plant to do it there. Um, so it's, it's not... It's, it's not uh, uh, very easy. But I'll, I'll tell you, it is surprising because I remember I went to a, a talk by um, Harrison Schmidt. He was one of the people on Apollo 17 um, mm -hmm. and um, he then became an American senator. Mm. Um, but um, he was an enthusiast and I, I he gave this nice talk and he said this at the end and I couldn't believe he was serious. But he, he, is, he is serious and some people are, but mm. it does sound to me rather crazy. But I'll just, since I mentioned Harrison Schmidt, um, 
I'll just tell you another anecdote about this. Um, the, um, he talked about being on the moon, and um, so someone asked him what, what, what was the, um, the, the, the most important uh, uh, feature, what did the main memory of being on the moon. And he just stood open mouth for a bit and just said, being there. <laughs> That's all, but, but the, 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 was the right answer. You know? It is, of course it yeah. is. It's, yes. I mean, but anyway, going, going back, um, uh, I, I think um, uh, manufacturing, um, uh, you know, if there's going to be a, a base on the moon, then probably you can make uh, some of the materials there. Mm. And of course, on Mars, ditto, rather mm. than carry, carry thing. And of course, for, for Mars, you've got, you, you've got to um, uh, produce the fuel for the return journey. Yes. Yeah. Mm. So just before the talk, uh, we went live. You and I were talking about the the idea that Elon Musk is um, building these Starship hoppers specifically mm. with the Raptor engines that run on methane, because obviously okay. when you get to Mars, you're going to need to refuel these things and mm. come back. And there are ways that they can do that mm. with methane. So mm. that that is already being thought about, which is great. Yeah. That actually brings me to another question, which I kind of think I dealt with reasonably well um, myself. But obviously, people want to know what what your thoughts are mm. on space travel um, yes. interplanetarily and the potential for radiation, solar flares, and mm. is it as bad as as people suggest it might be, or is it a fairly simple practical problem to solve? Um, well, again, I'm not an expert, but I think um, uh, if you were going to Mars and uh, if you were unlucky in that there was a big solar flare while you were on the way, that would be bad news. Yes. Um, and, and unless the um, uh, craft you were in, you know, had a heavy lead surrounding and things <laughs> like that, um, so so it it is a, a quite serious issue, and so um, uh, I, I think m many people say that um, before people actually land on Mars, there may be people who will go orbiting around Mars and coming back. And, yeah, uh, yeah. And sell tickets. Um, and um, much like Apollo did, much like Apollo. Yes, yes. Um, but the the idea crew for that uh, would be a stable middle aged couple, happy to be <laughs> up together for a year and a half. And Is that such enough, a thing? And, and, like a mythical and, uh, creature. Old enough that radiation damage doesn't worry them too much. Fair enough. Fair enough. No, that makes sense. Um, so the next question was about dark matter and dark energy. Yes. Um, and obviously, previously you were talking that we touched upon, I forget what the context was, parallel universes and so on. And I was having this conversation with a friend of mine um, who's also a physicist from Newcastle. We, we did our um, degrees broadly at the same time and had Paul Davies as tutors oh, and yes. lecturers oh, and so on. Yeah. Um, and we seem to remember some crazy idea being noted that um, perhaps on some kind of small scale, matter in different parallel universes is, is engaging across through the membranes and that's why we have dark energy and dark matter and yeah. and I remember at the time thinking what a complete load of fantasy that is yeah. but actually we've been looking for dark matter now for what is it is it 70 years 70 years since it was first posited and we haven't really found it, a yeah. sniff of it yeah, so yeah, yeah. will we find it does it exist or is it time to start reconsidering how gravity works on, on the colossal oh, scales yeah. of like, you know, um, of galaxies and, and local galaxy groups and all of that stuff? Yes, um, uh, well, uh, good question. I mean, my answer would be it's, uh, uh, we should still stick to the idea of dark matter in the sense of particles which have no electrical uh, emissions mm. and which behave uh, like a, a swarm of non-interacting particles mm. rather than like a gas. Mm. Because we know we know from the simulations I did and, and all the wonderful simulations of um, uh, formation of galaxies after the Big Bang, that um, the, dark, the dark matter, in order to lead to galaxies of the shapes we observe, um, has to behave like a swarm of non-colliding particles. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so they, it's got. Uh, if it was a gas, it w wouldn't give the give the right distribution of dark matter. Mm -hmm. So everything's consistent with it being um, neutral uh, particles. Yeah. This is all. Um, but but um, and it's true, true as you say that um, uh, there were candidates which could have been found, and haven't. But mm -hmm. my my take is that the um, parameter space that's been searched. Is very very small uh, compared to 
uh, where in principle there could be particles. Because for instance, there's a um, 12 powers of 10 between the maximum mass you can produce in an accelerator or indeed uh, uh, observe um, by the underground experiments um, and the so-called Planck mass, which is the highest mass of a particle. So there's a huge amount of space where particles could exist. And mm -hmm. there are other things called axions, etc. So th yeah, this yeah. is a long answer in saying that my, um, my belief that the dark matter is sort of um, a swarm of particles um, is in no way diminished by the fact that parts of parameter space have been excluded. Okay, because um, I know I know that there's um, there's quite there's there's a body of physicists, particularly those who have got a bit of a vested interest in in looking after and looking for sorry, dark matter, who don't even like talking about gravity on large scales being different, you know, uh, or or even don't even like talking about such things as um, if I remember this correctly, quant quantum loop gravity. Yes. yes. Um, but you know, well, so, I well, mean, so what you're basically saying is, uh, you know, everything's fair game at the minute. Well, I mean, uh, two different things. I mean, I, I think um, uh, well, one idea is that um, Newtonian gravity goes wrong on a scale bigger than galaxies. And we've been suggesting right. that. Um, and uh, um, uh, as I say, uh, um, that kind of idea doesn't fit the data nearly as well as what we have. So right. uh, unless you, and there's no reason why everything in the universe should shine. So the fact that there's a lot more dark matter, about five times more dark matter gravitationally than, than luminous matter, that mm. shouldn't be uh, surprising. Uh, I like that. There's no reason why everything in the in the um, in the universe no should shine. shine. Yeah, and so, so um, my, but, but, but can I just go on to say that, um, uh, what's called dark energy, which is yes, that was my next question, uh, and, and this is uh, Richard. Uh, Richard Dorset has asked about dark energy. Right. Yes, and and. Um, uh, and, and this does bring in loop quantum gravity and things, um, because um, although I'm hopeful that we will have a better chance of understanding what the dark matter is, um, the dark energy, uh, which is uh, some energy latent in empty space, mm. which has a sort of tension and things, and, and uh, um, we can't detect it locally, swamped by gravity, but mm. on, on average, on a big scale, the universe is so dilute that this push from empty space, as it were, overwhelms gravity. And that's why the universe is now accelerating. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think um, to understand this, to understand why empty space has these properties, uh, this is um, a really, really big challenge. And uh, I think um, the one thing that most people agree on is that we won't solve that challenge until we do understand the graininess of empty space, which would be on a scale of 10 to the minus 33 centimeters. That's a billion, billion times smaller than atomic nucleus. And that scale is what's called a Planck length. It's a scale where, um, uh, where, where, where gravity and quantum uncertainty, it's, it's a, a, it corresponds to the size of a black hole uh, whose, um, uh, whose quantum uncertainty is the, uh, in Heisenberg is equal to its, its radius. And so everyone agrees that um, the nature of empty space won't be understood until we have some theory that applies on those scales. And yeah. the most popular theory is some version of string theory, which says that um, each point in our space, if you could magnify it, would actually be a tightly wound origami in five extra dimensions, it's uncomplicated. <laughs> yeah. So there's a string theory, which has been yeah, yeah. the last 30 years. And, uh, loop quantum gravity, which you mentioned, is another different theory, but again, it applies on that tiny scale. And we're yeah. going to need some, something like that in order to uh, have any unification between gravity and the forces of the micro world, but also, I think, in order to actually understand why space, um, has, empty space, has this property of giving a push, which mm. is very important for the long term future of the universe. Definitely. It's um, which actually leads to another question. Um, someone was asking, is the state steady state theory just dead in the dust now? I mean, I, I when I was an undergraduate in the 80s, we were told it was dead. Yes. Um, is it still dead? Um, this I think it's, it's, it's still dead. Yes, I, th I think <laughs> it, it, it really. I think in most people's minds, it was killed off in 1965 when the uh, background radiation 
was discovered. Um, the, uh, oh, of uh, that body radiation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, before before that time, um, yes. there, um, there was already evidence against it. And this was the uh, debate between Hoyle and Ryle in Cambridge. Um, what ha what happened then was that um, uh, if, if you know, it was in a steady state, um, then there'd be just as many galaxies of all kinds at all epochs. And Martin Ryle claims that there were more radio galaxies, the, the subset that produced radio emission in the past than there are now, because there are more great distances than nearby. And so there were always some evidence, but the clinching evidence for most people was the uh, evidence from the Big Bang. And we now have, and that, that fits into the, the story very well. And, um, and so I think no one believes that the universe is in a steady state. Fred Hoyle himself, who was a really great man, I mean, despite um, him being wrong there, I mean, <laughs> the, the, he was a leader of the four, the four people who did nuclear synthesis, you know, Burbage, Burbage, Father Hoyle. He, he was the number one in that, in that team, no doubt about that. And uh, for 25 years, he was the world's number one astrophysicist and having clever ideas. Um, mm. But um, sadly, he was never reconciled to the Big Bang. He uh, ended up with a sort of steady bang theory, as it were. But he didn't go any further than that. <laughs> um, yeah, great. Well, thank you for that. Um, the questions are still coming in. I've crossed off my list of previous questions. I think we've got to all of those now. Right. Uh, so we have Matt. Matt is watching with his 10-year-old daughter, Eva, uh, listening intently. And she's an aspiring scientist, astronomer, astrophysicist. What advice could we could you give her now I very quickly want to plug the International Dark Sky Association here because mm -hmm. in April in the week between the 5th and the 12th they're doing a whole there's a whole kind of dark sky astronomy week and that would be perhaps a good date uh, for Eva and Matt to put in their diary and see what's going online mm -hmm. and I don't know that we're intending to do some kind of follow-up events online and mm -hmm. oh in the real world maybe even that'd be great but you personally um what would you like to say to people like Eva out there 10 11 12 years old yeah. some good advice um well I mean of course um uh, you, you you can start now uh, you can uh, look through a telescope and of course um, uh, um amateurs can now do as much as professionals could do in the past because uh, um the photographic plates which you had in the past were 100 times less sensitive than the yes. uh, cameras now so uh, you can do far more with the stuff equipment that you, that you can have at school uh, there. But if you want a career in astronomy and space, I think the advice I'd give you is to uh, just um, don't feel you have to focus on astronomy. Uh, maybe not until you've got your bachelor's degree, but, to, but I think you should um, learn physics and mathematics and computing. Coding and is course, a big thing now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and uh, uh, and of course, as, as a bonus, uh, learn some chemistry and some biology, because uh, <laughs> because so I not, think the fastest growing subject is going to be the not not too much to do, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, the, the the good thing, the good thing about about space science now and all these different people launching rockets and people like Jane Greaves analyzing you know potential right. phosphine Venus, in Venus, Venus and yeah. things like that, is that honestly. Any career path you take nowadays could lead you into either the space or the astronomy industry. I mean, they have fabric designers and, des and you know, to help build spacesuits and things like that. So there really is a vast range of things to do. Um, Absolutely, yeah. Mm. And uh, what I'd like to throw in there from a kind of a local regional point of view as well, in terms of what you said there, look through a telescope mm -hmm. um, and, you know, what you can do with astrophotography. These old things, these mobile phones, you can put that camera um, up to the eyepiece of a telescope and take amazing pictures of the moon. Absolutely. They're fantastic. Mm -hmm. And actually, most of these... Um, Phones now have a professional mode on them. You can pop them on a cheap tripod that you can buy, buy from Argos for 20 quid, put it in your back garden and start experimenting and right, taking yeah. pictures of the night sky. Nice. And, I, and I'm just going to plug, if you don't mind, uh, Martin, mm -hmm. Kielder Observatory here mm -hmm. are doing something called Escape Velocity, where they're encouraging people like your daughter, Matt, like Eva, so I'm talking directly to you here, look in this playlist, find the Kielder Observatory Escape Velocity video and and get stuck in with that mm -hmm. and um, maybe join a local astronomical society as well when we're all back to being able to do those kinds of things in the real world again. 
Mm. No, certainly do that, but uh, uh, just uh, enjoy your science. Have fun. Yeah, you've got to have fun. Um, crikey. So questions, questions, questions. Um, do you think humans will have to be some in some way augmented to make deep space travel viable? That's a question from um, Gestopian Stereoscopy. I'm fairly sure that's not their real name. <laughs> I think the answer is probably, probably yes, because not only are the conditions hostile, but, but of course uh, um, the um, uh, duration of any interstellar journey, um, even if you go to good fashion speed of light, is going to be very long. And uh, I think until we have post-human entities yeah. With much longer lifespans than us, then it'll be a deterrent. I mean, there are these, um, science, again, science fiction as the one by Banks of a, a, a sort of um, a spaceship, which is a multi generational thing. Yes, okay. yes. But, but, but just think, think of the life of someone who, who spends their, their whole life in, uh, in dark interstellar space. As part of this allegedly grand project, I mean, it would be mm. absolute hell. Uh, so so I, I, I think um, uh, travel by humans beyond the solar system um, is not really realistic. That's mm. a post-human venture um, by probably electronic entities, um, mm. and and of course even with AI maybe AI yes, entities. No, yeah. That, that's right. Yeah, yeah, mm. and. Um, um, but then obviously, you know, then we've got to think about 2001 A Space Odyssey and all the problems that they, <laughs> with indeed. how and all of that. Indeed, yeah. um, <laughs> um, I, 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 you've just thought, uh, you just reminded me of, um, and actually this relates to Game of Thrones as well. I had this theory that the whole of Game of Thrones was set in one of those great big tube, space tubes like Rama is in Rendezvous with Rama. Oh, yes. yeah, yeah. Big cylinders. Mm -hmm. Largely because whenever you watch the title screen, the land mass in the title screen was curved that way. Oh, right. And I was convinced that in the last ever episode, we were going to pull away and then it was going to put, and then <laughs> we were, it was all going to be in this weird, yeah, yes, I yes. forget what they called actually, this particular type of space. Well, there's, but... there's a guy called O'Neill in the 70s who first promoted these, you know, looked like Californian suburbs in the sky, you know. And, yeah, uh, yeah. and in fact, um, Jeff Bezos. With weather and about, clouds and things. Yeah, Jeff Bezos uh, talks about them. He wants to have. Uh, um, far more people living there than there are on the earth, um, which is pretty crazy, but also to have industry up there, which is not quite yeah. so crazy. Yeah, yeah, um, so great. Um... <clears throat> do, do, do. Lots of thank you for your contributions. Ah, this is a good one. Um, ooh, mau, mau. Aliens for artifact? <laughs> Any chance that might be an alien spaceship? Um, very weak evidence indeed. I mean, I think, uh, uh, I don't know if you follow the controversy, but... Yeah, uh, I have been. But uh, uh, Avi Loeb has uh, annoyed yeah. and upset everyone yes. uh, by saying uh, uh, by saying that uh, uh, those of us who don't believe his evidence are closed-minded, etc. Yeah. And there was, um, uh, uh, he, he spoke at um, what's called one of these golden webinars organized by Chileans. I don't know if you remember, it's a very good series. And um, uh, in the audience was Jill Tata, who's the, um, as you know, she's the, the uh, world's leading person in SETI for 40 years. And mm. he really rubbished her in an extremely rude way. And it, it was, uh, it really upset all his colleagues at Harvard, you know, that he should mm. be so bad. And so, so I think my, my answer is that he's done a disservice to the subject uh, yeah. because um, uh, everyone knows that um, if people are going to take a discovery of an alien artifact seriously is a case of uh, extraordinary claims requiring extraordinary evidence. Absolutely. And, uh, yeah. and uh, the people who uh, know about comets, etc., yes. uh, they are in no cases convinced by him. Well, no, I mean, comets, comets outgas, and the outgas produces thrust, and that thrust changes the trajectory of comets. And there, you know, Occam's razor, that's a really easy explanation as to what's going on, you know, what went on with the mammal. But like, like you say, why would an alien, um, you know, when you were talking about aliens coming to Earth and interfering yes, yes. with one or two wing nuts and then yes, doing yes. crop circles and leaving, if, if, if an alien civilization has advanced to do something like that, we're going to fire something at another solar system they would stop or it would really i don't know i mean it wouldn't just drift through well it didn't drift speed through well, that's could, my it, humble opinion yes well i mean i, I think um uh, you know my, my scenario for the for the 
for the future is that um, uh, you know, a civil civilization of flesh and blood like mm. ours may only last a few thousand years, if that. Mm. But uh, if it uh, uh, develops a sophistication that leads to um, uh, intelligent AI and uh, artifacts and things, um, which can themselves explore the universe, then they will go on for billions mm. of years. So we've got to rethink the Drake equation. The Drake equation has this number oh, of yes. the right And the Drake equation is very pessimistic because it puts in this lifetime um, of a, a, few, a few centuries typically, but mm. uh, that may be true for a technological civilization like ours. But if um, that leads to artifacts which are near immortal, then of course, you're more likely to see, to see those because it's unlikely that another civilization is so synchronized with ours mm. that we will see them in, in that sliver of time. And so um, uh, I, I think if we detect some, uh, some SETI signal, it's far more likely actually to be um, uh, something from something electronic, which is a uh, um, remote descendant of a civilization or something which is burping and malfunctioning. Um, that has been in interstellar space for a billion years. Well, and that's the thing, isn't it? Because um, the, the, the sheer vast distances between individual stars in our own galaxy yeah. means that even if, even if a spaceship is operating under some kind of conventional nuclear accelerated kind of thrust or, or whatever, yeah. you're still talking about tens of thousands of years of travel time. Yeah, indeed. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, and and which is, but, but that time's available, of course, if there's a few billion years left. But it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's not in our life. But, uh, but actually, can I mention one other thing? Because you know the Fermi paradox, where people say that it's most unlikely uh, that there can be these aliens, which we would know about, and they'd be here already. Um, but I think there's an uh, there are lots of weaknesses. In fact, um, Stephen Webb wrote an article a book with 75 arguments against it. You know? um, but, but I think there's one which I, I take very seriously, which is that um, um, we've evolved by uh, Darwinian selection. But post-human evolution will be what I'd call secular intelligent design. It will be de de designing things there. Um, and Darwinian evolution has required two things. It's favored intelligence, but it's favored aggression. But, um, but the sort of, Second set of design where where these machines design new machines or we design mm. um, it may, may not favor aggression at all and so it's quite possible that the super intelligences if they're all electronic or designed they certainly haven't evolved by Darwinian selection um, mm. they may be just um, leading contemplative lives and not aggressive at all so um, there's no reason to think that uh, there's going to be this sort of wave of expansion. And so we ought to have been invaded already if there are aliens. <laughs> if, if they are um, post-humans, which are electronic um, and not evolved by doing selection, then they could be just leading contrary lives. So it's Cybermen, but really kind, calm, relaxed, chilled out Cybermen and women well, yes, and people. Yes. Or just, just uh, <laughs> dolphins under some distant ocean, you know, just thinking deep thoughts. <laughs> Yeah, why not? Um, I, 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 what about the idea? I, this is this isn't a question from the audience. I'm just taking the opportunity here to throw a couple of questions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Being a bit selfish, what about the, the notion that actually humans might be the most advanced, evolved civilization within our galaxy? Well, it's, it's, it's possible. I mean, uh, it's even it's even possible that we're the only life in the galaxy. Um, I mean, it, it's it's sort of, People bet against it, but uh, mm. we don't know enough about how life evolved to know that. But it, it, it is, it is certainly, certainly possible. Um, mm. I mean, I, I think I'd slightly bet against it, but uh, we've got to bear in mind also that even if simple life is common, that still would allow intelligent life to be perhaps very rare. Because of course, um, if you think of, of evolution on the Earth, um, many of, of um, the um, uh, experts on that, like Stephen Jay Gould, they, they made the point that if you were to rerun the clock of evolution and uh, different contingencies happened and the dinosaurs weren't wiped out and all that, yes, yeah. you might not have ended up with intelligent life at all. And so, yeah. uh, uh, and so we don't know what the 
uh, probability is of getting from simple life to something we call intelligent. Yeah. Um, that, yeah that's reminded me of something that um, if, if I've got this right, uh, planets that are rocky, that are close to the solar system, like Mercury, Venus, Earth, and Mars, in many computational models, don't develop large moons. And in fact, we've got a moon because of a collision of a, of a body during the very early stages of our solar system, I think called, I, know, I might pronounce this wrongly, but Thea, a Mars-sized object, hit the Earth and produced the moon. Mm. Um, and the reason this, a lot of, I've read this with evolutionary biology um, from that point of view, but I, I don't really understand biology, but this seemed fairly simple. The fact that we have a moon means that we have tides and um, the, the people have speculated that it, that's a significant thing in the evolution of land animals because it would have meant that, that you know, the tides mean that we have um, creatures, organisms, plants, whatever, being yeah. left twice a day yeah. up kind of on dry land in this hostile environment. Um, and that the fact that we've got a moon with, you know, in an inner a planetary kind of solar, uh, solar system location yeah. is rare, yeah. um, but a significant factor in how we may have evolved. No, so, I think it's, uh, of course, we get a third of our tides from the sun. Mm. And so, so some people say that, uh, um, in fact, there's a professor at Oxford who makes this point that um, um, because you have spring and leaf tides, mm. rocky pools can be left undisturbed for a month. Yeah, and so that that means it's it's easier for uh, something to evolve undisturbed because uh, if the tides were all the same height, um, then the uh, same thing would happen every day. But, uh, exactly, and if there's no evolutionary pressure for any of these right, organisms, right. plant or otherwise, to come out of the water, why why would they? You know, yeah, that's, that's right. Um, mm. Lots more thanks. Lots of great talks. Um, a question about well, not really a question. Someone saying they don't believe that artificial consciousness would be possible. And well, what I would say to you, hmm. what I would say to you, Richard Dorset, is um, if you buy this month's All About Space, yes. there's a whole article in there by a professor who thinks that everything has consciousness and consciousness Even is all plants. linked. Sorry. Even plants. Everything. Uh, the, the, yes. it's, it's an interesting article. In and BBC Focus magazine, it says plants. But, but I mean, uh, but, but going back to, um, uh, to, to what, what he says, I think it is an interesting question because um, uh, yeah, it's not agreed by everyone, not by all philosophers, that uh, an intelligent machine would automatically have consciousness. Some people think consciousness is an emergent property um, of anything sufficiently complicated. Others think it could be more specifically linked to uh, um, the sort of uh, meat we're made of, as it were, and, uh, and she wouldn't have it. And the question is, does, does, does this matter? Um, you know, uh, if you've got competence, does comprehension matter? But it, when I wrote an article actually about, about this in, in a newspaper, um, I, I said that perhaps the, the electronic engine would take over. And there was an interesting response. Some people said, well, great, they'll have more intelligence, et cetera, et cetera. Whereas other people said, well, um, they may have intelligence and competence, but they may have not comp no comprehension, and no awareness, no appreciation of the beauty and wonder of nature. Mm -hmm. If that's the case, then it would be a sad loss if uh, they were the only intelligence which, which survived, if they didn't have consciousness, because um, uh, it's perfectly possible to conceive of an entity which uh, didn't have the um, sort of self-awareness and... Um, uh, uh, an emotional appreciation of um, beauty, etc., which we have. Um, mm. So it, it does matter, I think. I, I mean, I, I remember having this discussion um, about consciousness when I was looking at because you were talking about the gentleman who thinks that this rock is a spaceship doing a disservice. Um, what One of the things that bothers me about the, the age that we live in, especially with social media, is that really bad ideas get momentum and followers and engagement so much more than other people and that there's there's a physicist I was reading about a couple of years ago who put a paper out saying that every if I get this right every neutron and um, proton has a black hole in it 
because he applied classical physics calculations to it. Mm-hmm. And, and all, I, all I keep saying, and I keep seeing him appear in my timeline. He's got half a million followers and famous people think he's awesome. And then you've got him linking. Then you see Professor Cox arguing with Deepak Chopra about quantum physics. People mm-hmm. either not really understanding that you know things about like the interconnectedness and action at a distance and, and all of that or deliberately misrepresenting it for clicks yeah. um that must you must you must yeah. hate that there's so much different yeah, it, disinformation it, that it, we have to fight it, against it's more serious when it affects um, medical views doesn't it um, oh god yeah i mean we're living right in the middle of a pandemic now yeah, so i've so been it, saying it's very years it's yeah. sad in the case of intellectual arguments. It's terrible. I've been saying for years and years and years that you know things like homeopathy, anti-vax, all these different ideas. That's great if you want to believe in that, and that's fine. Um, but but you know you've got to look at the evidence, and 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 these things are dangerous and they're scary because you hear about people, individual people having problems. Well, now we're living in this global pandemic, and suddenly those opinions are going to be massively amplified. And, you know, um, it, it's terrifying. Uh, I, and I agree with what you were saying about biology before. Physics is so much easier. Stars are such simpler objects. <laughs> yes, yes. Aren't they? Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Richard Dorset, who was asking a couple of these questions about artificial consciousness, says he st- he's a philosopher. He studied philosophy. Let's not go there. I agree um, with you, Richard. Mm. Um, I don't think... Lord Rees, we have any more questions that I haven't answered. And just to the audience, uh, the people watching, if you fired questions in the chat and I haven't missed them, uh, sorry, I have missed them, I haven't asked, that I, I can only apologise. Um, it's There's been a lot of questions, a lot of really good chat. Um, and unless you want to close with any final comments or, or additional points on, on any of the questions. Well, I... I could ramble on for hours, but I. <laughs> I um, but can I just say, Roy, thank you very much for the invitation and uh, congratulations on what you're doing uh, for um, um, education and uh, promoting dark skies and all the rest thank of you. it. It's great. Thank you. Because, I... um, uh, because um, you know, it is, impo- it is important. And just one thing about dark skies, which I'm often asked to pronounce on, really, um, is, um, you know, we as astronomers care about it. But it's not just astronomers who care. I think it's very important to get the message that uh, um, dark sky is part of our environment, which has yes. been uh, um, wondered at by everyone throughout human history. Yes. It's a common feature of our environment. It's always been there, all parts of the world have seen it. So it is very special. And it's very sad that many young people now never see a proper dark sky if they live in the city. And I think we ought to... Uh, um, foster more dark skies and uh, all the other um, uh, ways in which we can diminish e- extra extra light, which is mm. unnecessary, etc. And uh, the way I put it is that, um, um, you know, uh, I, I wouldn't say I'm an ornithologist, but I'd miss the songbirds in my garden. Yeah. Literally, you don't need to be a serious amateur astronomer in order to uh, uh, feel you're being deprived if you yeah. ever see a proper dark sky. Yeah, and I, I know that you, I don't know, do you, are you chairing the advisory group for the APPG for Dark Skies, or are you just I, on it? I'm a co-chair, yes. You're a co-chair, yeah, and yeah. and and we we actually, one of the events on this YouTube playlist, right at the very start, last last Friday, so a week mm-hmm. last Friday, was John Barentine, Bob Mison, and yes. our local tourism officer, Duncan yes. Wise. Very yeah, Bob's difficult. the real hero of this subject. Bob, Bob is, I mean, he's been doing it for decades, really, yeah, yeah. decades. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. Bob, we absolutely a legend, um, and uh, the IDA now kind of trying to kind of put a more global um, uh, 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 view on that. But the thing for me, and again, actually, this is where the internet's done really well in terms of plastic. You know, people were banging on about plastic for a long, long time, mm-hmm. and then suddenly there's videos of people pulling straws out of turtles' noses, mm-hmm. um, creatures being wrapped up in beer cans and nettings, and it's tragic. And then mm-hmm. um, David Attenborough gets involved, and yeah. suddenly we're all, everybody now, everybody mm-hmm. is thinking about what we can do to deal with plastic. Mm-hmm. And I think, and bees, everyone's really upset about the bees, you know? And, and for me, 
if I can kind of use this audience, <laughs> we need to do the same with light pollution because something like 60% of food in our food chain is affected positively by nocturnal pollinators. Um, and I mean, people don't really, I mean, some people are scared of moths even, there's a whole thing about that. And I think we need to be much more aware of that and how, what happens is just because we all go to bed, it doesn't mean the world stops turning and animals don't stop doing what they're doing. And mm. uh, we've got to think about the impact on human health as well. There's a lot of evidence coming out now about pressures uh, for, for, you know, different types of lights and people not sleeping properly. Um, and, and, and when we say light pollution, I think we all really need, all of us really need to start thinking about that second part of that word pollution. I agree. Mm. Because you wouldn't leave your taps running all night long, mm. you know, baths and sinks and things like that. And yet, you know, I come back from the observatory at three o'clock in the morning and all the industries, uh, all the all the commercial sites, you know, you go past Team Valley here, Sainsbury's, places like that, they've got their lights blaring. And why? You know, because the only people driving around that time of night are people like me. I don't want to see that. Um, so thanks for your praise. Uh, just to reiterate, uh, I will take that praise on behalf of Keeler Observatory, Twicebrood Observatory, Duncan Wise, the NNPA, Stonehoff Observatory, and my team at Battlestead Observatory. We could not have done this um, um, without everybody getting involved. Um, thank you so much again for reaching okay. out and, and okay. replying and getting involved. Hope to come for real and see you all in 3D sometime. Yes, yes. Well, we'll definitely make a note in our diaries for this time next year, and, and that'll be great. Um, so, uh, Martin, Lord Rees, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end the live stream. There are still questions coming in. I'm really sorry, people. We'll just have to get Lord Rees on another time, somewhere, somehow, and, you know, ask those questions at some point. But I think, you know, we've been on for nearly two hours, and... <laughs> Wow, thank you. A bit of a marathon effort. I'm going to end the live stream now. Um, and Martin, if you and me could just stay on for a couple of minutes or so just to tie that up. Um, thank you for all your questions, everybody. And um, we will see you again. And our last event is tomorrow at seven o'clock. So watch out for that too.